companies freak out because they're like, oh no, you're losing us money. No, you're not losing anyone money. You'll lose the money later on anyway. I worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different companies like KPMG, PwC, all these different orgs that had different problems. Currently, you're a director of digital innovation. Previously, you were a low-code lead and power platform evangelist. I don't call it selling. I call it sense making. Like why tech matches their problem and how to solve. In the beginning, when I started consulting, I would sugarcoat things a lot because I was afraid of upsetting my customer. I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, the more honest you are and the more you just like, hey, this is how the tech works and this is what we should do. Based on my experience, most most of the time you win. Without being rude, you like to say it how it is and hold nothing back. When was the time on a project that, that being honest saved or helped the project? They said to me, Chris, you have to start dressing like a business person. It wasn't who I was, right? I still had to play the wearing those types of clothes game. The way I am now, I'm extremely direct, extremely bullshit, extremely flat honest about the way that I perceive technology. I've done the work to learn internally about myself. Earned the right to run around full of tattoos and wearing crazy uniform shirts. Why do you think some people struggle to adopt that methodology. I'm happy to try new things, but actually I know this won't work. And I'm like, that's what will work. So that was a big lesson learned. I'll tell you an interesting thing, right? So when I started out in tech, I <laughs>Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. My name is Griffin Lickfeld, the host of Citizen Developer. And today I have with me, Chris Huntingford. Chris is a director of innovation at an enterprise grade IT consulting firm where he helps organizations understand how to leverage and adopt low code and generative AI tools. After working in the Microsoft space for the last 15 years, Chris has implemented different software solutions to countless organizations. He is a Power Apps Fast Track recognized solution architect, Microsoft MVP, Microsoft certified trainer, leader of the Badger clan, which admittedly raises several questions. And lastly, a hackathon maestro. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Griffin. It's actually epic to be here. I, I have to tell you, I love this idea of what of this podcast, right? And I'll tell you why. Because everyone is so super fixated on doing the tech stuff and talking about like being a nerd and, you know, building apps and building flows. And actually, I feel like you've got a very different pitch to the whole thing. Um, and after hearing a bit of your story about how you got going and, uh, know what you've been doing i really i really like this i think this is wonderful so thank you so very much for having me yeah i think there's a lot of there's there's a lot of really good resources out there okay how do i how do i build this component of a flow or how do i create this business rule or, or whatever there's a lot of really good technical resources out there and and i mean on this channel i i have several of those sort of things as well but i i do feel like it's it's I've recently gotten into enjoying podcasts and video podcasts and, and different things and kind of focusing the conversations on, you know, maybe softer, more broad topics like like leadership and teamwork, consulting, um, personal and professional development and different things. Because I feel that those conversations have been really important for me, arguably more important than uh, how to build a flow, you know. So um, yeah. I I wanted to to start the conversation. Thank you for all that, by the way. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start the conversation of, you know, when I first got introduced to you, I, I was warned respectfully to, you know, you got a lot of personality and to watch out. So I, I rarely find people that are, you know, more passionate or have more energy than myself. But I, after getting to know you, I think you have me beat, right? I mean, just by looking at your shirt compared to mine, you know, you, I mean, you look great, you know? Um, how are you able to let your personality shine through and be so fun and upbeat in a space that can be so professional like IT consulting? Dude, I've gone through a lot of iterations, a lot. Like what you see in the crazy like T-Rex unicorn shirt is not what you would have seen five years ago, maybe. Um, it's, quite, it's been quite an interesting journey. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting thing, right? So when I started out in tech, <laughs> I didn't, I wasn't fully tattooed. I wasn't covered in like loads of ink. I didn't wear crazy t-shirts. And what was interesting was, um, I remember getting, I was at this company in South Africa and they said to me, Chris, you have to start dressing like a business person. And I'm like, dude, I'm in support and maintenance, man. I'll go and fix people's tech. Like what, what does that mean? So I went out and bought a bunch of polo shirts and I remember even tucking them in at one point. And, um, yeah, it, it wasn't who I was, right? But I still kind of I still kind of got to do it. And I actually I enjoyed it, but like I hated I hated doing that. 
and um, I remember something that happened to me. I was at, I moved to the UK. I'm South African, by the way. That's where the accent's from. So your love for American football. Um, I love rugby. I just have to let you know. So I just want to say rugby is way more bad. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna... <laughs> I totally get that. I, I regret not getting into rugby and stuff in high school. I do. Dude, you would have killed it. Continue. You would have killed it. Um, so yeah, I moved into this, this role in the UK and again, the firm, amazing bunch of people. I loved working. It's, in fact, it's the UK version of where you work now. And um, I was there for five years. And I really loved working there, but it, actually at the, t- at the time, I don't, I still don't quite think I was, I'd figured myself out. Like it was very, man, I wore cardigans. Like what the f- is a cardigan, right? Like who wears that? Anyway, um, this whole thing came around where I was still myself. I was still doing a lot of work around figuring myself out. And I had this amazing mentor called Michelle Maiden, who still works at the place where you work. And she's just a wonderful human. And she kind of got me quite grounded into like, being a really good consultant, being a really good pre-sales person, but also like doing the doing things the way I wanted to do things. And it was quite great, right? Because I still had to play the wearing those types of clothes game. But actually, I learned that I can be quite like forward because South Africans are extremely forward people, right? So I figured I could be quite forward, but also um, like be really professional and get get the things done that I wanted to get done, right? So I did that. And actually, we started getting a lot more business. Um, I managed to work with a lot of the guys from your end of the world. So people like Sean Tabor, Joel Lindstrom, um, and actually Joel and Sean, by the way, were incredible mentors to me, just throwing that out there. So yeah, kind of building that process of learning about who I was, was really wonderful. But let me tell you the way I am now, I'm extremely direct. I'm extremely bullshy. I'm extremely flat honest about the way that I perceive technology, but it didn't come with a lot of hard work. So running around or flouncing around into conferences wearing a rain a rainbow unicorn T-Rex shirt, which is what I do, and I do it with customers, um, it's it's been earned, right? And I think that's really important to understand. It's not just being like, oh, this guy doesn't know anything. This guy knows stuff, but I get to be what I want to be now externally because I've done the work to learn internally about myself and actually spend a lot of time. And dude, when I say a lot of time, I mean like, external reading after hours staying up until midnight every night like learning about technology now i feel like i'm good at it but i've earned the right to run around full of tattoos and wearing crazy unicorn shirts so that's just how it's been man that's an incredible point actually where um you're you're given the opportunity to let your personality shine through and maybe keep things a little bit lighter you know wear wear funky shirts and not have to wear a shirt and tie to a on, in a client meeting, but, nope. and I mean, I don't, you won't catch me in a shirt and tie either, but at least a collared shirt on most times. But, but nonetheless, you're able to do that because your work or your technical experience can kind of back it up. And I think yeah. that that's an important thing to, to measure is you're, you don't have a reputation for like your reputation of being great at what you do is not because you have a, you let your personality shine through. It's because you're great at what you do and he lets his personality shine through. Like there's a very distinct difference there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it is that, right? And actually what, what's interesting is the customers I work with and the people I work with, they prefer this to suit and tie guy. And actually one of the customers I'm working with right now, they said to me, they said, they've been working with me through a number of partners. And they said to me, Chris, we brought you back on board because we really would like you to be brutally honest with us and tell us what's right and what's wrong. And um, I do, like, I'm not rude. I just tell them, like, this is not going to work and this is why. And I'm like, look, I know I'm happy to try new things, but actually I know this won't work. So let's give this this other way a go. And it actually does work. But at the same time, the first time I got into a call with them, I was wearing a unicorn hoodie. And it was quite funny. And um, I was with the, the um, director of collaboration. And this is a big 55,000 person organization, right? And we just got along really well. And the whole team and I got along. And now, like, we just do loads of stuff together. But it's because, like, I try my level best to do what's right by the people I work with, not what's right by me. And the example I would give you is um, my partner said to me recently, not my partner, but the the customer, sorry, the partner that I work for, said to me, "Um, how much time do you spend in your customer's shoes? I'm like, well, you're very lucky you get 1% of my time as my partner. I spend 99% of my time with my customer. I'm like, in fact, if I could spend my 100% time, I would, but I have to do timesheets and crap like that. So, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 
I, I think there's something you had said there, and this is something I wanted to ask you is, you know, without being rude, you like to say it how it is and hold nothing back. And just like, like you've said several times, be very direct. And I, I think you've answered, you know, why that's why clients value that. But yeah. and I, I wanted to mention a book, which I've, I think I've mentioned several times now in other conversations is this book called Getting Naked by Pat Lencioni. And I've I don't know if this. you're, yeah. yeah and it, it kind of takes this principle. It, it definitely applies it more to like when a client asks you something you don't know to like be vulnerable and, and say, you don't know, don't act like you do know, but it, it still applies to like be who you are. You know, if, if, you know, I think it's, it's very easy to read if someone's being themselves or if, yeah, not. Yeah. It's, especially if, you know, someone's paying you for your services and then what you're giving back to them is something that seems fake. Right. And so, um, yep. I don't know, I guess what, when was the time on a project that, that being honest saved or helped the project? Um, so it's, it's quite interesting, right? Basically every time. And the reason is because when you do that with, a, with, a, with people that you're working with, I feel like they value you more as a consultant and they want to, they want to, they want to be around you a lot more because like, you're not going to lie to them and that's what I won't do. I'm sorry, but it's not going to happen. Like, I, even if a salesperson says to me, "Hey, man, can you just think about this?" Um, I will not do it. I, I will, I will, I will obviously do what's right by the customer, but I'm not going to bullshit them. Like, it's not happening ever. Um, and that's just a rule that I have, and it's ethically bound. I'm, I know it sounds a bit crazy, but it's just not going to happen. Like, if somebody says to me, "Technically, Chris, should we implement this version of Power Automate with 250 API limit?" or 250k API limit or this one for 40. I'm going to be like, look, the other one's cheaper, but don't do it because it'll suck, right? Like, I'm not going to lie to them. And also, especially when it comes down to things like data, and that's actually stood me in good stead, right? And actually what people do with, with me now um, is they come to me and say, Chris, listen, we were told this. What do you really think? And I'm like, look, dude, as an example, SharePoint is not a database, right? Like, it's, it's, it's a great tool for storing unstructured data, but SharePoint lists are not meant for that, right? So what I will do is I'll be honest with them and I'll say, look, you guys need to pay for the licensing. We'll suck it up and have it break later. And that's really helped, right? From an architectural perspective, from a trust perspective, from customers actually getting the best out of the tools, from Microsoft not getting a bad reputation. No one loses when you do that, right? No one does. And I think that's really important. There are scenarios where it doesn't work, but I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, the more honest you are and the more you're just like, hey, this is how the tech works and this is what we should do. Based on my experience, most most of the time you win. This is a, a question that's on the spot, but why do you yeah. think some people struggle to adopt that methodology to how they approach client conversations? I think it's because there's, number one, a layer of imposter syndrome. Like, I think that some of the time people don't feel like they've earned the right to be that brutally honest. I, I get that, right? And I mean, I understand it because in the beginning when I started, started consulting, I would sugarcoat things a lot because I was afraid of upsetting my customer. Now I'm like, dude, if you don't want to be upset, don't come to me, right? Like, I'm going to tell you the truth. It's that simple. Um, I think there's that. The second thing is also people are managed badly, right? So like, as an example, if you're a consultant and you walk into a customer and you tell them the truth and that hurts the sale, like companies freak out because they're like, oh no, you're losing us money. No, dude, you're not losing anyone money. You'll lose the money later on anyway. Right? At least you're losing it up front quickly, not later on when the whole thing's a complete show. So <clears throat> I say to people all the time, like, you know, don't be afraid. So the people that I work with, sometimes they don't know how to relay the information. There's a certain etiquette in doing that. You know, you don't call it's like the example is if you find a customer with a really badly built solution, you don't say, Oh, that's terrible, because that's calling somebody else's baby ugly. You say, Can I have a review? And you take a look and you're like, All right, you know what? I understand how it was built like that. Given the circumstances, maybe we could have done things a bit differently. Let's try this. Not that's crap. So I just think there's an element of fear, imposter syndrome, and also the, the fear of the results. You know, and that that's what worries me a lot is that salespeople typically are to blame here, where they're like, "We want the sale. We'll sell it at any at any cost." And this person just go in and say that, and I'm like, "Absolutely not. That's not what we'll do." So yeah, there's a bit of fear involved there. And I, I pity consultants who are in that position. Yeah, I think there tends to be a, and it's, I think it's very natural dynamic where, you know, sales teams, they want to sell. They want to meet all the business's needs as cheaply as they can. 
and yeah sales s- sellers are great and they they know what they're selling i'm not saying that but sometimes there's just details and expertise that you can't expect a salesperson to have and so sometimes like those conversations like there there there's a very natural yeah. dynamic between sale, sales sellers selling and over promising and then sometimes the actual you know consultants or architects or you know development teams have to kind of all right let's let's maybe manage the scope a little bit here um exactly so i think that's great um yeah and i'm sorry i know it's a bit i know it's a bit brutal like i'm not blaming salespeople for everything just most things (laughs) (laughs) no that's mean i'm sorry that was super cheeky (laughs) (laughs) all good so uh, another thing i wanted to ask you was you had mentioned that you haven't always allowed your personality to shine as much as you do now was is there an example that you're willing to share or comfortable sharing that made you yeah. flip that switch and realize like, no, I need to, to do this better. Yeah. 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 A few times. Right. So I do have this thing where I overstep a lot, but I tell customers, I'm like, look, you know, I'm not a salesperson. I actually should be in sales, but I'm not. Uh, and I, I told them, look, you know, I'm on this call not to sell you anything. Like I'm going to explain to you how this actually works, right? And the reason I do that is because I have been on calls and I had one quite recently where I was on with a customer who was extremely closed-minded. Um, they weren't ready for what I, had, what I had to say. I think it was brought in too early into the conversation and they were talking talking about return on investment and they were talking about Copilot and they're like, oh, tell me about the use case. And I said to them, but dude, you can't speak about the use case about Copilot. That's like saying, what's the use case in Excel? I'm going to make a spreadsheet. I'm like, dude, how do you ROI that, right? And they're like, oh, no, no, we want to know the use case. And the words were, we think it's bullshit that you can't tell us one. I'm like, no, I think it's bullshit that you don't understand the concept between what a use case is and what a scenario is, right? And that's the whole thing is that I feel as if a lot of the time, like I can get quite wrapped up in what I'm saying and what the, and, and, and in the moments. And I don't necessarily think I'm always right, but I get very direct very quickly, especially if somebody I don't think has done their research, hasn't done their research. Um, I said to somebody the other day, they were like, oh man, you know, we think A, B, and C. And I'm like, okay, I, I kind of agree, but like what books have you read or what articles have you read that suggest that? And they couldn't give me a, re- a source. And I'm like, well, that doesn't help me, right? And I do the same with customers. I'm like, if you've done your research, you'll understand that these are the things that you need to think about. So in that call, I actually, I actually had to dial it back a lot. And I did. And I actually, I hope they listen to this, right? I had to dial it back quite a lot because what I worked out was that actually they weren't ready. And some people aren't, right? Like some people are just not ready to hear that actually this is a very different way of thinking, especially with low code and AI, right? It's not what's the use case because that doesn't work. Okay, you're thinking about a way bigger spectrum here. So what I did off the back of that was I messaged our, um, what I, I call him my sense maker. His name is Azim Zakar. So he's, he's on my team at work. He's an absolute legend, right? So he takes all the crazy crap that goes on in my head and he deciphers that into things that make sense. So I said, Azim, we need to sense make the concept of what a use case is, what a scenario is, and why use cases shouldn't be used to dictate return on investments. And I'm like, that's what will work. So that was a big lesson learned. And on the next call I had the day after, not with them, with another company, I said to them, look, I'm going to be quite upfront with you. If you're going to talk to me about use cases, this isn't going to work and this is why. And what was awesome is they're like, oh, no, no, we totally get that. Like, actually, we were looking at more of the process map. And that's that's really helped me, right? So I actually know I need to clarify that upfront before I start talking about return on investment. So I can't always be right, man. But when I when I am wrong, I will learn the lesson and, you know, build on that. That's awesome. I, yeah, I don't think there's anything I could possibly add to, uh, to what you have to say there. And uh, if you are thinking to yourself that you want to get into low code development or learn about the power platform, then I want to personally invite you to sign up for this completely free self-paced course that is going to cover everything you need to know to begin low code development today. Not too long ago, I was a complete beginner and I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't even know what the power platform was. The content in this course is handpicked by me so you can understand the basics of the power platform and ultimately be prepared to take the PL900 certification 
if that's something you're interested in. If you are interested, be sure to follow the first link in the description down below and do not forget to use the promo code YouTube at checkout in order to get the course for completely free. This is going to give you immediate access to the entire course so that you can start to change your future today. Now let's get back to the conversation. I want to transition the conversation and, and, and yeah, yeah. kind of ask you more things that that I mentioned in your intro. I I mentioned I need to I need to learn and excuse my ignorance, what is the Badger clan? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, this is the greatest story ever, right? So I'm obsessed with badgers. I like small woodland creatures, and this one's a more vicious woodland creature. And um in COVID, right? So when COVID hits a lot of the people that we used to socialize with, and there was lots of them, dude, like the community's big. I mean, you know, dude, you're, you're in the community right now. Like, and, um, we needed a way to start collaborating, communicating, having a bit of fun. So we created a group called the bespoke badger. So bespoke for coding, like custom coding. And then the badger as in like wild, vicious mammals from the woods. And, um, we started it up as a virtual pub where we started off with four people joining this virtual pub every Thursday. So we'd, you know, just drink beer and, you know, have fun, play games and play virtual like cards against humanity and stuff like that. And then this group grew and it grew and it grew. And at one point on the call, there were 250 people of people on a Thursday on a Zoom call. Dude, we were scrolling screens. I was like, what have we done? So we had a WhatsApp group, we had a website, we built a company around it, not to make money, we just thought it would be fun. Um, there was merch, so people made badges, so badger badges. And um, yeah, it became quite a quite a quite a clan, right? It was actually really cool. We hosted events virtually. Um it was wild, dude. And we met every Thursday and we were legitimately up from six PM in the evening until most nights like three, four AM. On the, third, on the Friday, it was just great. But it was a cool way for people to kind of get through COVID. And actually, I met a lot of my community contacts through the Badger. So people like um, Jeff Myers um, and a, a whole bunch of people just joined the calls randomly. We also did something really cool. We hunted Zoom bombers. Would you, I don't, Zoom bombers? I'm not even familiar so with what a Zoom that bomber, is. what they would do is um, when you put a public link out to a call, they would join the call and do horrific things on the call. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. And um, so what we did was myself, Keith Watling, a bunch of us used, we put public links out and we used them as bait. And when they joined the calls, we wouldn't do anything dodgy, but we would just give them such a hard time. And the funniest thing happened. We made friends with a dude in California who was doing this to people. And he, we asked him, like, why are you doing this, bro? And he's like, oh, you know, we just want to spend some, find a way to, to spend some time and pass some time. And um, it was wicked, bro. Like, we we just met the most amazing people on these calls, right? Not the Zoom bombers. We had one. That was a one-off thing. But, um, yeah, eventually, you know, we had a WhatsApp group. Um, it just got huge. It just got so, so big. So the Badger Clan is a bunch of community reprobates who just get together at random conferences and run around screaming about badgers. Very fun. You. Another part of, of something you're involved in, you said you're a hackathon maestro, and I, I wanted to, to ask you, I'm a little more familiar with what hackathons are as opposed to the Badger Clan, but yeah. why do you enjoy these and why would you maybe recommend to other people get involved? So with hackathons, huh, this is a really good story, right? I need to explain that I need to explain the start of the hackathons before, before I can explain why they're important. Is that cool? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, in around twenty, uh, I want to say twenty eighteen, twenty seventeen, uh, Will Dorrington, myself, and Kyle Hill, we decided that we were going to create a power platform hackathon. We didn't know what a hackathon was. We just thought it sounded cool. So, we did some research and uh, we built this framework. And the goal was. How do we get people to start learning about Power Platform and low code really quickly and, um, you know, just get into the community? Like you were telling me that you had come in through one of the Hitachi programs where you would like started out knowing nothing and you came into this world where you're like, oh my gosh, you're doing low code, right? Now, imagine that at a big, big, big scale. So we figured out a way to bring people in from all walks, walks of life and diverse people. We didn't want like every middle-aged white dude and their cats, right? We were like, how do we bring in everyone, right? So we pitched it out there. We got college kids. We got um, people from all over the world coming to these hacks. And it started off at about 
30, 40 people, maybe 50, I think, on the first one. And we grew it so much that at one point we ran a virtual round the world hack of 2000 people. That was Will's hack. Um, so it was wonderful, dude. Like, and the goal was to connect different walks of people from different walks of life and really, really different folks, like from all over the world together in one place, but also connecting them to technologies they hadn't used before. And Power Platform at the time was the right technology. So we figured out a way to do it. We figured out a model and it worked extremely well. What we didn't realize is how big it was going to get. So we got petitioned by Microsoft to run um, one of their hacks at Microsoft Business Application Summit. We ran the virtual one, which was absolutely amazing. Um, and yeah, so it kind of grew and grew. But I think the, the magic of a hackathon is this, right? There is very few places in the world that you can go to where you have like-minded people wanting to learn and wanting to experience different things, wanting to connect with people, whether you're a geek and you code in your mom's basement, or if you're a flouncy project manager who wants to do something amazing and you know not write code, to somebody who's never seen tech before, to citizen devs like yourself or potentially who you were, now you're like a weapons grade functional consultant, right? I'm guessing. And you have all these amazing groups of people just connecting up. And what we do is we mess with people in these hacks. So we never allowed them to bring their own teams. What we would do is we would let them register and we would build the team. So we looked at the roles on LinkedIn. I'm giving away the secret sauce here. We looked at their roles on LinkedIn and then we would merge the teams up or mix the teams up depending on who we found. There were times where we did let actual companies join, like when Matt's Necker's company, k and joined, they won the second hack. And they were from Germany. They flew all the way to the UK. They didn't know what a hackathon was and they won. Now, Matt's and Bjorn ran Color Cloud this year, one of the most amazing conferences I've ever been to. And it all started off there from them being at a hackathon. So hacks create community members that want to give back and really love to understand technology. That's what's so special about them. I hope that makes cool. sense. That was a long explanation. <laughs> no, that was good. I like. I am not. I understand kind of what it is, but I haven't necessarily been involved in one or, or why you you have such a passion for it. But that's that's super cool and just the ability. I mean, that and the Badger Clan, just this idea of creating communities. And I think it's interesting how, like, I wouldn't have guessed the idea of you know just based off the name of Hackathon of being so beginner friendly. Um, oh, dude, yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah, kind of like you alluded to, I, for anybody who, who's not aware, you know, I, before I became a, an associate consultant at Hitachi, I had no idea what Microsoft Dynamics or the Power Platform was. I, I went to, I studied business in college, so I was aware of what a CRM was, but I didn't have any sort of computer science background. Um, I was wanting to be a, an accountant um, and realized I, in my last semester, I did not want to be an accountant, you know? Um, yeah. And so... I uh, kind of one thing led to another, learned about Hitachi and what they called the launch program. And uh, one of uh, an earlier episode, his name is Mark Lindbergh. He was actually the founder of, of the launch program. And so lots of really good conversation there that I had with him about how he started that successfully. But yeah, that gave me three months to learn about not only just how to be a good consultant, how to, you know, how to write a good PBI, you know, an acceptance criteria and how to you know do a good product demo, but also all the technical skills, how to create a power automate flow, how to create a power app, how to configure a power app, how to understand what solutions are and security, like everything you could imagine, you know, kind of in this like three month curriculum, and as well as kind of get some some hands on experience where we actually we did it was called Project X and we did a kind of role played where we um, we were developing just Hitachi's internal system um, and but we we went and talked to, you know, subject matter experts that and, and figured out the pain points and created, you know, had a sprint and created all this stuff and, and built it and demoed That's it wild. and tested yeah. it. And so it was really, I mean, it, it would have been impossible for me to get into the space without some sort of opportunity like that. And I think it's really cool that these hackathons, um, in a smaller scale, in a sense of timeline, but in a um, much more people, but in a smaller sense, are able to kind of just introduce some of the the introductory concepts to the power platform and low code development. Super cool. So, dude, I, I have to tell you, I have high respect for you, and um, I'll tell you why. Not only because you're a good human, you you took Thank the you. time. Yeah, you you legit took the time, dude, and you actually went and sat and learned, and you spent the time learning. 
there are a lot of people who get given these opportunities just by the way right like it's not it's not a you there's a lot of people and they'll sit in calls they won't put the camera on they won't say anything to the people they'll just sit there and not listen when we ask for feedback there's no feedback right and i understand that it's hard because there's a lot going on so for you to pick that up is extremely important dude so really well done i think it's wonderful news and actually you deserve to be in the position you're in man thank you yeah i mean it, i was able to i mean i I do try to be recognized as a hard worker. That's how I try to characterize yeah. myself. But And so in those three months, I went from Googling what Microsoft Dynamics was in my interview to passing the PL 900 and the PL 200. Um, Mate, that's so good. That's honestly amazing. It was, <laughs> I mean, it, it was, it was, it, the, the environment and the atmosphere allowed me to really focus, you know, um, and just, just learn. And I also... I mean, I don't want to, I guess if you're still listening, then I guess I don't mind telling people I'm 24. So I was 22 at the time. I mean, it was very different than if I was 32 or 42 or 52, you know, you're definitely, your capacity to learn is, I mean, I was young, I was recent college grad. It was, so I did have some things in my favor, but nonetheless, you know, just the opportunity to, to learn and different things is really cool. I, I could talk to you about stuff like this forever. Um, I like for this, it. For I the like sake it. of time, there's other things I wanted to ask you. But go ahead. You got well, one more thing? You, you, the thing is that you got your spurs, right? I say this to people all the time. When you're getting into low coding, when you're getting into tech in general, okay, it's all fine reading a book. It's all fine doing an exam, but actually getting in front of people, having the conversation and learning, like you're doing on this podcast and you've done on seven podcasts before, Yeah. Yeah, I'm not right. sure off the top of my head, but yeah, this is yeah, seven or eight lots. or nine. Yeah, yeah lots. Um, it's really important because you're learning, like doing this, you're picking up new skills. I'm learning from you, right? Like this whole soft skill development thing is really important. So kudos to you, man, really. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, to transition us. Um, all right, if anybody if anybody listening has, a, has the ability to reach out to Chris, he will has a, a knack for making you feel really good about yourself. Let me just say, <laughs> all right, all right, moving on, moving on. Um, so currently you're a director of digital innovation. Yeah. And previously, I did some digging on your, your LinkedIn profile. Previously, you were a low code lead and power platform evangelist, uh -huh. um, at least on LinkedIn. That's what you said your role was. How... You know, when I first read these, I'm like, what does that even mean? How are these roles different from, you know, a more yeah. familiar consultant or an architect type role? Yeah. Um, so architects have to behave themselves. So that was out. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it's interesting. I, I feel like. OK, I'm going to again, I can only explain this through experience, right? Like I can't explain this to I love with, it. with so when I was in South Africa, like I never actually did the functional consultants or the developer or the CDA developer process. I never did that. So I used to, I used to write code and um, I worked for a bunch of courier companies and then I got landed in, in 2008, I landed up doing Dynamics version three. Okay. And um, I knew how to write code. Like I knew what to do, but I wasn't very good at it. I, but you know, you can pick it up, dude. Code's code, right? And um, I went to work for this company and they were like, oh, you're going to go work in support and maintenance, which was the best thing I ever did in my life, right? Because I worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different companies like KPMG, PwC, like in South Africa, right? like all these different orgs that had different problems. So it wasn't like you working on a project where you have like five weeks on a project or whatever it is. Dude, I, w I had a day to fix a problem at these places. So there'd be like a, and this is vis in Visual Studio sometimes 2003, right? They're like, go and find this plugin. And version zero and version three, you had this horrible external workflow tool and the email router was all external. And they're like, go and find this problem. I'm like, oh man, how the fucking hell do you find this problem, yo? So you're like rooting through all this stuff and you have one day. That's all you got, man. You have a day to figure it out. And the pressure was unbelievable. But I loved it because like eventually I got so good at problem solving. Like my, I learned how to debug and I learned how to problem solve extremely quickly. So they said to me, dude, do you want to do pre-sales? And this is in 2011. Okay, so I'm like, what's pre-sales? They're like, you just get to go and like do demos and sell things to everyone. Just go and be yourself. They're like, go and do you, right? I was like, okay. So I didn't go to architecture. Like I somehow just learned how to architect while I was in pre-sales. And I just learned how to be a developer. And so through the entire time of 2011 all the way through to now, I still do pre-sales. 
I just have different titles. So in the beginning, it was Solution Sales Professional or SSP. And then I, I went, when I went to Hitachi, it was Pre-Sales Solution Architects. And then when I went to Microsoft, it was Cloud Solution Architects effectively. And then at Avanade, it was Global Power Platform Lead. And then it was Low Code Lead. But all the time, dude, I'm always selling stuff. I'm always getting customers to understand. I don't call it selling. I call it sense making. Like why tech matches their problem and how to solve it, right? And actually, dude, I never did functional consultancy. Like I didn't go through an associate program. I didn't do solution architecture. I just learned the skills as I did pre-sales. That's why the roles have never, ever mapped to any human role in the world. So I've been extremely lucky, but I will tell you something, and I have to kudos my mentors for this. This is not a me thing, right? Like I had extremely strong mentors, and I always have and I always will from the get-go, even until now, like I've got a very strong mentorship um, team that help me and do things with me and, and teach me. So yeah, I, it's, that's why I haven't gone through functional consultants or this or that. It's my, my skill set is EQ, not IQ. Yeah. What, what does, so you, you work in pre-sales at the end of the day is what you're kind of, you know, involved in and, and things. What, say I have no idea what that means. What is, what is pre-sales? It's a great question. So pre-sales is a equal mix of EQ and IQ. So it's a symphony of like left brain and right brain, left hemisphere and right hemisphere. Um, plus the ability to go through to a customer and explain the value of technology and how it will solve their problems. And that's what I that's what I do really well. And I always have. Like, I don't know why, I, I don't know how, it's just always made sense to me. And creating things like analogies such as digital Lego and, um, you know, app snacks and things like that. Like teaching customers actually, you know, it's not, it's not scary. Like, it's not scary at all. It's actually really easy to pick this stuff up. So that's what my, that's what my role as pre-sales has always been. Um, yeah. What? What is some advice maybe you would have for, say, someone is in an architecture role or a consultant role, or not necessarily, but their interest has now been piqued by you explaining that there's this there's this area of, of pre-sales that yeah. they that's an option. What advice would you have for somebody that is interested in something like that? Learn and be ready to learn. Dude, it's it's that's why I'm in innovation now. It's like just be ready to pick up a book and read. And um let me give you an example. Recently, you know, the whole Copilot thing came out. I spotted a gap in the market and I'm like, hmm, this is not about AI. This is about security and data. So I went to learn Purview. I'm like, I don't know Purview. I don't know M365. I've always, always, I've always teased SharePoint so much. So like, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go and learn that now. So I did. And now I know Purview. Not very well. I mean, I could do a bit more, but um. Like I spent a lot of time learning it and going through the process. And this was about a year ago. Now I know low code. I know co-pilots. I know um, dynamics. I'm learning. I know a lot about data. I know security and governance just because I'm willing to pick up a book and go and read something. But dude, if you want to get into this role and you want to get educated and you want to get further, it's incredibly important that you learn that your time is really gold and really matters here. And you can't do everything. Like you can't. You, you literally can't. And sometimes, like, you have to just learn that, you know what, you don't know the answer, but that's why I have Griffins and Joels and Sean's that I can go out to and ask questions to. And that's where you use your network. But I'm telling you, dude, education and learning in, open, in public is the most important thing I've learned since I've been doing this. What do you do to, to learn? You mentioned you go read a book. I mean, are you are you reading a book on right. SharePoint integrations? I couldn't mm -hmm. imagine so. You know, what, what right. are you going and reading? So... I have a very different way of learning, right? Because I'm extremely ADD and like I struggle to pay attention. I do a lot of things, right? So first things first, I attend events. That, that's my way of picking up information. And I look at trends, right? So my goal is to talk to people. And this conversation here, I learn. Um, I have a podcast later on with another friend. I'll learn, right? And then I'm like, oh, he's talked about one lake. What is one lake? Why is one lake important? Then I'll go and read about one lake a little bit on the doc side. Then I'm like, oh, sick. Um, somebody's made a video. And then I'll go check out the video. And I'm like, oh, sweet. Then there's another thing. And then with Copilot, they're the same with Purview because nobody's really written about it. I was like, wait, what is this thing? And then I just experimented and I opened up and I paid for my own license. And then I started messing with policies and, oh, dude, it was great, right? But what I learned, 
is that it's a big combination of resources that you are able to um, accumulate. Not everyone likes videos. Not everyone likes learning that way. Not everyone likes reading. Me, I have to press buttons I, and break it. Yeah. Very, very cool. Yeah, I, uh, I think it would be uh, remiss not just to mention the, all the AI capabilities and advancements that Microsoft is coming on top of all of just the general power platform advancements and dynamics things that they're they're rolling out. What are some innovations in the space that you are particularly excited about? And maybe what are some things that you find yourself talking about more and more in this pre-sales sort of role? So I think the advancements that I'm going to talk about are not as cool as everyone else thinks. And I'll tell you why. I think that people forget that there's a lot of cool stuff out there, but until you sort out your foundations and your base, the cool stuff doesn't matter. So for me, I love AI, right? I think it's wonderful. I think it's very clever. I think the GPTs are great. I think large language models are great. I think that being able to build apps in 30 seconds is wonderful. But actually, dude, what I really give a damn about is how secure my data is and where it is. And the advancements that they're making in tools like Purview, so taking Azure Purview and then munging it together with Compliance Sensor, um, being actually able to bring Dataverse into Purview and understand things like what data is in Dataverse, like if there's PII and why, um, being able to block down those SharePoint lists that people are oversharing, it sounds so boring, but actually, man, you get that right. You open up a world to other people to be creative, okay? So what I want to do in my role is I've learned to be creative. I can be as creative as anyone wants. In fact, that's why I wear ridiculous shirts because, yes, I'm a lunatic, right? But actually, I understand the foundations of why things happen. So let me give an example, man. You all citizen developer program that um that that you know you've gone through. The only reason citizen developers are able to create safely is because people like me exist and we don't lock things down. We create an area where they're able to do things in a much more safe environment. So that for me is an innovation in itself, is enabling people to create safely, not creating safely, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. When is a uh... Is there kind of a common conversation that you have to have where maybe people are, are uh, opportunities are brought to you and they are, you know, gung ho about implementing Copilot or some sort of feature into their system and you just got to be like, okay, let, let's pump the brakes here. We need to, yeah. you don't have the foundation yet. What, what's a, is there a good example there or maybe, you know, speak to that in uh, the conversations yeah. you've had to have? Yeah, it was a shitty conversation I had with the customer last week. It was not a great conversation. And um, I did get a little bit gung-ho, but I realized that they're just not there in their thinking, right? And it, and it's not that it's a bad thing. It's just because you have to be ready to hear what's actually going on. You know, a lot of people I talk to in the UK, um, and, and actually I spoke to somebody in the US, and I got educated by somebody in the US recently. I can't tell you the name, but they're um, a big financial services firm. They were like, hey, man, we've gone through all this stuff. We don't even need Purview for Copilot. And I'm like, that's really interesting, man. Like, I'd love to know more about how you're implementing it. Because for me, that didn't make sense. But they're doing it, and they're doing it well. So respect. Um, but I think that pretty much every conversation I have with anyone right now is, hold up. Just, just be sure of where you are. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, it's not going to change the world if you just take a couple of days out and see where you are first. And if you find something weird, cool, we can fix it. But if not you know carry on yeah but it's every day yeah and i think copilot especially i think people oftentimes generative ai is very cool it's you know it's the clickbait of 2023 and 2024 um everyone in the space oh, yeah. especially is talking about it. i mean there was a super bowl commercial on microsoft copilot you know for, no. for american american football super bowl and i I think it's it's very cool, but I think people and businesses in particular give it too much credit, right? Copilot yeah. can only be as good as one, the database it's looking at, the knowledge sources that it has to reference, and two, the quality of its users' prompts, right? Like, like I don't know. I, I think it's I, I think it's very natural for businesses to want to say, like, oh my goodness, this copilot would save us so much money. The return on investment, you know. The licensing is not, not that expensive and like it's, you know, expected to save this much time. Like this is, yeah. let's turn it on. This is great. But I think, you know, 
in the on those Microsoft pages, it doesn't talk about, well, okay, well, if you have a bad system, it's going to be horrible, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, so yep. I just think it's interesting that you, you bring that up. Um, Stories, the fun stuff, man. I mean, like, unfortunately I am the fun stuff guy, but the fun stuff guy has now realized that actually the data, the security matter more than the fun stuff. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the thing that scares me. I've become a little bit grumpy in my old age, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> i was uh i was talking to um actually the, the episode before this uh, a, a gentleman named dougie wood he's kind of a sharepoint guru um microsoft mvp and he has a lot he has a youtube channel where he makes a lot of content about sharepoint and so i i wanted to ask him his opinion on this and he was talking about that um Copilot is actually exposing the lack of security companies have in their SharePoint uh -huh. Dude. in the sense of, yes. you know, th there's not necessarily, you know, links that users are regularly navigating to or seeing, but nonetheless, so there, you know, it is kind of protected, but at the same time, it's not actually protected and Copilot I mean, just just looks at the security. It's not looking at, you know, where are people likely clicking on nope. it and different things like that. So Copilot then exposes information <laughs> that organizations yeah. aren't expecting. I, he gave an example that um, like, say I'm I'm management and there's some sort of document that talks about how much my employees are getting paid, you know, yeah. um, and while that might not be, you know, readily accessible, if it's not explicitly locked down. An You'll owner might it. be able to ask Copilot, how much is such and such getting paid? And that information yeah. would then be surfaced, you know. Um, Bro, AI, AI, AI is allowed halo for terrible data. Yeah. That's all it is, dude. I mean, none of this stuff yeah. is new. It's just, oh, it's just easier to find. And it's funny, right? Because I don't think people actually realize like how much information they share. I'll, I'll tell you something interesting, right? Like, and I say this to everyone all the time. So Griffin, you and I have LinkedIn accounts, right? Like we're connected up and we have, we probably have, I have a Twitter account. Do you have a Twitter account? Yeah. I do have a Twitter, but I don't particularly use it, but continue. Yeah. And you may have a Facebook, right? Like, I don't know. Sure. I have, I have a Facebook. Yeah. So your data is a digital representation of yourself, right? Okay. So you obviously don't expose everything in the world to everyone in the world on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Like you actually filter things that you post. Like if you have a, terrible night and you wake up feeling absolutely horrible you're not going to take a selfie and be like look how bad i look yeah. no <laughs> it's not what's going to happen dude you're going to be like oh no you know you want to expose the best stuff and your organization's data is a digital representation of your organization your customer and you so why is it that we find it necessary to not protect that and treat it like crap it's like okay i'm going to put all my employee salaries in a share points list it's in the name. Okay. So I'm going to put it in a share point list and, you know, we'll just leave it there. But that's, that's a way of looking off the data. And what Copilot does is it makes it even more explicit, right? So I can't understand why it is that organizations think it's totally fine to just turn on anything that will expose that to people without thinking about it, right? Like, I'm not going to turn on your privacy filters on Facebook now. I mean, dude, if you gave me your password, I wouldn't be like, hey, Griffin, I'm going to turn on every privacy filter and show every single part of your life. I haven't planted a GoPro on your head, have I? No, absolutely not. We're not that stupid, right? But that's what organizations do. So we, it's our responsibility as people who actually know better to go in there and say, listen, dudes, I know you think this is a wonderful plan, but no, and this is why. So that's my data rant. There's always going to be a data rant, dude, at some point. Yeah. No, that that's awesome. I, I think the conversation has been great, and um, I kind of want to tr to transition us to our the after hours happy hour of the oh, conversation. Yeah. Yeah, and, cool. You know, if anyone hasn't noticed, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, expose you here, Chris. He's been been drinking margaritas the whole episode yeah. here, so he's already been in the happy hour for the last forty five minutes. Wait, wait, wait. I need I need to make this very clear. While I'm there, we go. Ching ching. I have a yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um. So this is really just a space to, you know, we're, we're out, unplugged from work. I, I, I just enjoy talking to people about things they're passionate about outside of Microsoft Dynamics, outside of the Power Platform and, and things like that. And, and one thing that I know that, that you're passionate about is fitness and health and yeah. 
the gym and, and training and um, I love it. I uh, I don't necessarily always bring it up, but it is in my background. I like like you kind of mentioned. I used to play American football, and so I, I love I love health and fitness and training. And I'm trying to lose a little weight now because uh, don't need <laughs> to be as as big to to play college ball anymore. So, um, yeah, wh- wh- why are you so passionate well, about that? And what are some things, or maybe maybe even some advice for the listeners? Yeah. Um. So I have I have three things that okay. Other than friends and family, so this is caveated, right? Like family family and friends are extremely important. Um, but fitness changed my existence because I was a go to bed at 1 a.m., wake up at 9 a.m., roll into work, do a meeting, eat crap, like not not look after myself type of human. I suffer from depression a lot, like extremely badly. So I have to be careful about like what I do, what I drink, what I eat, how I wake, how late I stay up. Um, and actually going to gym evened me out like i did muay thai boxing and stuff for a little while but going to gym evened me out a lot and now i can't imagine my life without it like it's the one thing that i can do every morning which gives me a clear head i get two hours every morning on my own because i need that man um it gives me a clear head i feel good i get to look after my body correctly and be healthy and actually it's evened me out completely so i i suffer way less from depression and anxiety than I used to because of this. And then that rippled into other parts of my life where I was teaching myself how to eat properly. So I'm going through an eating change now where I'm not drinking beer. Like I've moved over to margaritas and red wine. Legit, like I love beer, but it's it's just not good for my my health, right? So at least the margaritas got like proper fruit. But also <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to justify lime myself juice. here. Yeah, you know. yeah, lots of lime juice. Yeah. Um but also it 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 replicated into like my sleep pattern. So I changed my sleep pattern. It changed my eating pattern. So yeah, like like for you, you would have done this when you did American. You probably do it now actually. But the fitness thing for me is huge, 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 huge. If I don't go to gym, dude, I'm a nightmare. So yeah, and then I'm. Yeah. I think I have I have two other non-negotiables. My two other non-negotiables. The other non-negotiable is travel. I will not give up my travel ever, ever, ever. And my third non-negotiable is I love tattoos. I love them. Like I've got loads and I love them. I think they're great. They tell a story. So those are my like three things. Yeah, that's super fun. And just to kind of echo um, what you're saying there about health and fitness, I think, you know, the the physical benefits of physical activity, are, I think are pretty clear to see. But I mean, even just just general health, um, things you can't see about your physical health and your emotional health and your mental health. And, and it truly, it truly helps in every way. I, this is by no means a fitness channel, but, uh, if anybody, um, would like to, to connect with me and ask questions or, or things like that, or, or Chris, I'm sure would be happy to uh, yeah. point you in the right direction and, and different things like that. You know, Chris, we, we are at about time. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for, for being on the Dude, episode. Anytime. I mean, um, I know the scheduling for this is a little complicated, so I appreciate the, the, the agility and the flexibility to, to make it happen. The conversation has been great. If somebody wanted to connect with you, um, what would be the best way to do that? Yeah, I think probably Twitter or whatever they're calling it these days, X. Um, LinkedIn's the best. I'll do my level best to answer like, but uh, if anyone wants to hit me up, just have a chat. Dude, just like we did, you know. Um, so yeah, please do. And and also, I just want to thank you. And I'll tell you why, right? Like, not just for having me on this podcast, but also doing something different. And it's quite refreshing to talk to somebody who's not just like nerding out about tech stuff, but actually like doing real life things and telling your story. So I would encourage anyone that actually has the time to talk to you. And I will be sharing this as widely as I can. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. I. Links to, to connect with, with Chris in the description or the show notes down below. Chris, you, I'm on top of the world right now. You, you are, you're making me feel great. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you to you for sticking to the end of the video. My name is Griffin Lickfeld, the host of Citizen Developer, and I'm excited to connect with you guys in the next one.